second bonus episode of Tearing Rabbit Holes. You can watch regular episodes on YouTube or listen to them wherever podcasts are heard by searching for Turing Rabbit Holes. In this episode, we're going to look at fractional calculus. It turns out that we've been taught integral calculus, and we take first integrals, second integrals, third integrals, or similarly, we take first derivatives, second derivatives, third derivatives. It turns out that both of those types of integral and differential calculus can be combined into one using the notation of fractional calculus, and people were aware of this as far back as 1819. We have just kind of forgotten about that. So please pay attention in this, where the mouse is right here, I'm looking at the one half derivative of x. And we're gonna show that that equals two times the square root of x over pi, square root of x over pi. And the way we're gonna do that in very quick step-by-step -step order is we're gonna look at the definition of a derivative ddx of f of x is the limit as epsilon goes to zero of f of x minus f of x with the argument x minus epsilon over epsilon. It's the standard definition of first derivative. But now watch, we're going to iterate. We're going to define the second derivative as the difference that we just defined for the first derivative minus the same thing except with x being replaced with x minus epsilon and x minus epsilon being replaced by x minus two epsilon, all of that over epsilon. When we simplify all of this above here, we're gonna get f of x minus two times f of x minus epsilon plus f of x minus two epsilon over epsilon squared. If we continue to repeat this for the third derivative, where we take this quantity here and put it over here, and then we advance the same quantity over here on the right-hand side by a minus epsilon versus x minus, versus here x, x minus epsilon, here x minus two epsilon, here x minus three epsilon, and we simplify the algebra, we get this. And, and if you're beginning to notice, this the binomial uh, series is beginning to happen. Here's one, three, three, one. And this was one, two, one. Uh, Pascal's triangle, right? So if we iterate this, differentiation process n times, we can demonstrate to ourselves inductively that what we're gonna get is epsilon here, one over epsilon to the nth, the sum of the alternating sign minus one to the jth power of the binomial coefficient times f of x minus j epsilon, where j is counting from zero to n, this counting integers. And the best way to prove, or at least feel comfortable that this is true is to consider, say, the derivative of x to the fourth. Let's take the second derivative using this formula that we have right here. Fine. So we're going to have 1 over epsilon squared. We're going to have the sum going from 0 to 2, negative 1 to the j, binomial coefficient 2 over j, where j is going to go 0 and 1 and 2, and f of x minus j epsilon. There it is substituted in with f of x minus j epsilon being x minus j epsilon, parentheses to the fourth power. Let's go ahead and expand out the series here. We have one, the first term, the second term, and the third term. And when I simplify things, I'm going to get x to the fourth power minus two times x minus epsilon to the fourth power plus x minus two epsilon to the fourth power. And I clean up all my algebra. And what remains, after all this cleaning up, is 12x squared minus 24 epsilon x plus 16 epsilon squared. And of course, when I take the limit as epsilon tends to zero, I get 12x squared. And, and we know that if we take the first derivative of this, we would see 4x cubed, and the second derivative would give us 12x squared. It's following exactly what we would get with the regular calculus, except here, instead of taking the derivative locally, that we might take the derivative and evaluate it at some point x naught, we're actually creeping along the function of x. We're, we're, we're at x, and then we're sliding over, shifting to by minus epsilon, and shifting by minus two epsilon, and up here, all the way up to the jth value of epsilon. So this is not a local uh, version of, of, of the differential calculus. And uh, we'll see how that affects things in a few minutes. 
here comes the connection to how we can take derivatives uh, with a, a, a fractional, fractional derivatives. That is, we have this symbol. This is the, the binomial coefficient that we uh, all know. That n over j here the, uh, really is defined as n factorial over j factorial n minus j factorial. This is an integral, which I will prove below in the box below, that the integral from negative 1 to 1 of 1 minus x squared, well, that quantity raised to the nth power dx, is equal to this. For now, let me just solve algebraically for n factorial. I put this over here and this under here, and I take the square root, to get, and I have a, a formula of n factorial that's based on an integral from negative 1 to 1 of 1 minus x squared to the nth power, the, the quantity to the nth power, and with, with these factorial and powers of, of, of n here. And in fact, if you say let n equal to negative a half and do the integral, you would get square root of pi. So there we have a uh, fractional factorial and related to the square root of pi. So let's go ahead and prove that integral. We let x equal to sine theta and therefore dx is equal to cosine theta d theta. And so naturally this becomes 1 minus cosine squared can become sine squared to the nth power. Um, sorry, that meant uh, cosine. 1 minus sine squared is squared is one is, is cosine squared. And then we have the cosine theta d theta, so it becomes cosine to the 2 nth plus 1 theta d theta. And you can look this up as a table integral or do it by induction. You can do it to the, f you can just plug it in and iterate and iterate and iterate and convince yourself that this is the formula that will happen. Or you can do it by induction. And you're going to get 2n, the quantity to the double factorial. And the double factorial is defined by, you replace it by 2 to the nth n factorial. For if n is even, and you replace it by 2 to the n plus 1 factorial over 2 to the n factorial factorial for if n is odd. And so once again, we have if I, exactly what we had up here. If I solve for n, I get 2n plus 1 over here uh, on top, and I get 2 to the 2nth plus 1 on the bottom, and I take the square root, and this integral is really the same thing as that integral. So I, I now have the right to replace the symbol where n and j the binomial coefficient, where n and j have been integers all our life, by the gamma function. And you should look that up. The gamma function of n is n minus 1 factorial. So I'm making that connection right here. And you should look up the gamma function. I'm using the gamma function to replace the binomial coefficient. So instead of having n, I now have gamma to the new plus, uh, gamma of new plus one, and j is gamma as new plus one minus j. So this is going to allow me to take my iterated derivatives, where I was doing first derivatives, second derivative, to get to this binomial expansion, these uh, binomial coefficients here, and an expansion of the derivative in terms of f of x sliding along zero epsilon, one epsilon, two epsilon, which we proved gives us the derivative of x to the fourth power. The second derivative gives us it gives it to its, us correctly. Now it generalizes to the newth derivative d to the d newth dx to the newth f of x. Still have the limit, but it's now one over epsilon to the newth. And now the sum. You see the see what's changed here. I replaced this symbol, the binomial coefficient, with the gamma of nu plus 1 over gamma of nu plus 1 minus j. Everything, this is the same. The j factorial is here, and the alternating sign is here. And now I'm about to move into, away from n equals 1, 2, 3, one, one, uh, two fractional. So, so when n or nu is a positive integer, the, the binomial coefficients vanish when n exceeds j. That, when, sorry, when j exceeds n, that makes sense. When this is greater than that, that's it. And as epsilon tends to zero, the values of, of f of x minus j epsilon uh, with non-zero binomial coefficients converge on x. Okay, this is lines up with the local definition of, of, of derivatives. And 
By the way, I took the absolute value here. It need not be positive. So let's pay attention to this really carefully. We're, we're in the simplest form of integration, we partition a function into equal sized uh, si rectangles of equal width and variable height when we're, when we're doing the Riemann sum approximation. So here I have the, uh, the interval from x to x z naught divided by epsilon. Okay, so I'm going to define a new operator. I'm going to show you that positive fractions correspond to the differential calculus, the fractional differential calculus. And if the fractions become whole numbers, then we have just the calculus that we were taught. But if we have negative powers, we actually have the integral calculus. So this operator here, ep, uh, sigma sub epsilon, uh, operates on f of x by changing it to f of x minus epsilon. It's a shift operator. Consider the nth uh, consider d to the nth being operating by, by this operator n times. And we define it as the limit as epsilon tends to 0, 1 minus epsilon, sigma sub epsilon over epsilon to the nth power f of x. Let's, let's, <clears throat> let's test out this operator. Let's do the simplest case. Let's do the first. So I'm going to have the limit as epsilon tends to 0, 1 minus sigma sub epsilon over epsilon to the first power times f of x. And I just plug in what the operator tells me. It says, oh, f of x distributed to the 1 gives me f of x. f of x being hit by that operator gives me f of x minus epsilon. I divide by epsilon. As epsilon tends to 0, I get back my ordinary first derivative. And, and please do this for the second and third and fourth derivatives to convince yourself this is just a fancy way to write this formula right up here. It's a fancy way to write up that formula with this operator. Now consider the operator to the negative 1 of operating on, on the function f of x. As the limit is epsilon tends to zero, of one minus sigma sub epsilon over epsilon to the negative one, f of x. Well, recall, so this is to the negative one. So this is really, this is really on the bottom, right? And it's just in general, if I have one or one minus z, uh, uh, this is the, the expansion that I would get, one plus z squared plus z cubed, dot, 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 dot. And then here's what I was talking about. Epsilon, consider it to be some width divided by n minus 1, uh, where n is, a, is, is the total number of intervals, then, then this is a fixed increment. So now look at this. d to the minus 1, f of x, is equal to epsilon, because the epsilon is going to go to the top. This is to the negative 1th power, so it's up top. This is to the bottom, where I'm going to have my expansion here. 1 plus sigma sub, uh, f sub epsilon plus sigma squared sub epsilon plus dot 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 f of x. And if I operate that, f of x times that, I get f of x. And then that gets me one shift. There it is. That gets me two shifts. And I keep marching all the way until I finish at f of 0. Because I start at x, and I'm moving to the left. Keep moving to the left, two, two epsilons. And eventually I get to, to 0 in this case. And so I Look at this. I get the limit as epsilon tends to 0 of f of x minus k epsilon times epsilon, where epsilon is the width. Think of that as your delta x, and f of x is, is moving along. <clears throat> You're building rectangles of height f of x minus k epsilon. Is that not this integral? And there we go. And if I just replace the minus sign over here, I get the integral from 0 to x of f of x dx. So there you have it. If you differentiate to the negative 1, if that is you take the negative 1 derivative of a function, you're actually taking its, its integral, its first integral. So now we get to what I promised you. I'm going to take the 1 half derivative of x. So I'm going to set n, or really new, to, to the 1 half, to, to equal to 1 half. And I'm going to look at this operator here, 1 minus sigma sub epsilon over epsilon to the 1 half. Well, that's the same as 1 over the square root of epsilon, isn't it? And uh, square root of 1 minus epsilon. And that has an expansion of 1 minus a half epsilon, minus 1 eighth, dot, 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 dot. We're going to start at x, and we're going to step backwards to the initial point, which let's say call it 0. And so our steps are going to be 
We're going to go to the left by an epsilon, by two epsilons, by three epsilons, until we eventually get three epsilons away from zero, two epsilons away from zero, one epsilon away from zero. We are zero at zero, our, our initial point that we chose. So here we go. The one half derivative of x is the limit as epsilon tends to zero of one over epsilon to the nth. And our and how many integrals, how many intervals we're going to do is x divided by this fixed width epsilon. And we're going to sum from starting from zero to all the way to that. Here's our alternating minus one to the jth power. Here's our gamma functions, and here's f of x. So let's do it. At zero, we have gamma to the three halves. Zero factorial gamma to the three halves. There's our there's f of x. Minus 1 to the first power, gamma 3 half, gamma 1 half, x minus an epsilon, plus a negative 1 squared. Just keep substituting in there. And just keep substituting the terms, x to the gamma to the um, gamma uh, argument 3 halves, gamma argument negative 1 half. And keep going all the way until you, until you get there. And this is the last term. Okay, and all that times x. So when I clean up, the notation is really operating once by that, epsilon, twice, uh, by this, I hit the operator twice, the operator thrice. If I look at that, I can collect it as one over square root of pi epsilon, one minus the square root of, of one minus sigma sub epsilon x. I can re rearrange terms this way. Just keep rearranging terms. I'm doing nothing but algebra and rearrangements. And then I finally take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And sure enough, this epsilon goes away here, and I get one, one epsilon left here, x over pi, the square root of all that, times two. So there's a, a good treatment of this subject, the fractional calculus theory and applications of differentiation and integration by Oldham and Spanier, uh, Dover, 1974. Here's the, here's the links on the, on the internet. And by the way, this fractional calculus has uh, applications to physics, like diffusion problems, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you for listening, and we'll have some more bonus episodes up soon. Thank you.